Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Khaled El Gindi. I'm a fellow with the Saban Center for Middle East Policy at the Brookings Institute, and I'm very pleased to uh, moderate the panel this afternoon. We've had a very high bar established with the first um, set of plenaries, and I'm confident that uh, this group will not disappoint uh, either. So um, let me introduce our panelists this afternoon. To my immediate left is Dr. Hossam Zumlut, who is a Palestinian senior diplomat who served as a PLO representative to the United Nations, I'm sorry, United Kingdom from 2003 to 2008. He served in positions uh, at the UN, uh, Oxford Research Group, the London School of Economics, and the Palestine Economic Policy Research Institute. He's the author of numerous publications, uh, including Building a Palestinian State Under Occupation, uh, and um, uh, an, is it an upcoming book? You're a contributor to an upcoming book uh, entitled State Formation in Palestine, Viability and Governance During Social Transformation. Um, and uh, uh, to his left is Dr. Mustafa al um, who is, I think, well known to many of you. He's a, in addition to being a member of the Palestinian parliament, uh, he's a uh, physician by profession. Um, he is also a former minister uh, of information in the 2007 National Unity Government uh, of the Palestinian Authority, and was a candidate for president in 2005 and did actually uh, quite well, for those of you who don't know, in those elections. Um, he previously served as Se General Secretary of the Palestinian National In Initiative, one of the newer uh, Palestinian political groupings that um, I believe is slated to join the PLO. Uh, he is, uh, as I said, a physician by profession uh, and an activist focusing on social, political, human rights, and peace. Uh, he writes extensively for local and international audiences on civil society, democracy, and the uh, political situation in Palestine. And to his left is uh, uh, Omar Shaban, who is the founder and main driver of the Palestinian think tank uh, known as uh, PalThink for Strategic Studies, which is an independent think tank based in Gaza. Uh, he is an expert on socioeconomic issues and politics in the Middle East, um, and I should point out that yeah, he is in, politically an independent and not affiliated with any faction, uh, which has enabled him actually to have uh, quite good relations with uh, political leaders of, uh, across the political spectrum. <clears throat> He's been invited as a frequent speaker in various forums. Um, uh, he has been invited to brief uh, diplomats uh, on a regular basis, parliamentarians from the United States, Europe, and elsewhere uh, who, who visit Gaza. And uh, anyone who follows this issue, particularly uh, in Gaza, certainly knows who Omar Shaban is. And to his left, um, Dr. Mohammed Dajani al Dawoudi, a Jerusalem born scholar and founder of Wasatiya, a modern, uh, moderate Islamic initiative launched in Palestine in March 2007. He's also the founder and director of the American Studies Institute uh, and formerly of Al Quds University. Uh, Al Dawoudi is the author of numerous books and academic articles, uh, both in English and Arabic, um, on, uh, including uh, Wasatiya, the Spirit of Islam. Uh, and he's written actually a, a great deal on um, the concept of reconciliation between uh, groups and uh, conflict resolution. He is a frequent participant in local, regional, international conferences, um, just as he is here. And he holds uh, two doctorate degrees, actually, from the University of Texas and from the University of South Carolina. So please join me in welcoming our distinguished panel. Um, I thought maybe we would start with the broad and sort of work our way uh, in to uh, uh, sort of conceptually. So Hussam, I'm going to start with you and ask you, I think, a question that is on the minds of a lot of people about the failure of the latest round of negotiations. Tell us why, in your view, the, the latest round of negotiations failed, 
And does it mean the failure of the two-state solution itself? First of all, uh, Khaled, allow me to really use this opportunity to thank uh, the organizers for convening the conference and convening this very particular panel. There are two different things about this panel. First, we, you gather here, uh, us Palestinians, without having a peace process, and this is a change, really. We exist only if there is a peace process. I'm glad you have thought about this. Second, you also gather us without the presence of Israeli speakers or American speakers. So we matter as Palestinians, our internal politics. I, I salute those who thought of this idea, and this is a very good start. Second, answering your question, as you know, we have lived a nine-month period of a very heavy American involvement, the Kerry, Secretary of State Kerry Peace Initiative. And we have few things to learn from that experience. Number one is that, you know, America, like any other place, has, and its leadership has a personal side, a policy side, and a politics side. As far as the personal side, I don't believe we Palestinians will ever, ever have a better combination than Obama and Kerry. And it was very obvious, if you look at the trajectory of the U.S. involvement in the Israeli-Palestinian context, you will see that the U.S. administrations have intervened either after a mega major event like the first Gulf War, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Bush senior administration, or after a major, major crisis like Bush Jr. and the Second Intifada and blood being spilled, or after an opportunity and jumping on the wagon of uh, a domestic opportunity like Oslo and the Clinton administration. The Obama administration, out of all odds, and given that actually the Palestinian-Israeli situation, relatively speaking, given the region, is the most stable, ironically, comes and picks this conflict, which talks a lot about uh, President Obama and Secretary Kerry uh, convictions, belief, vision, commitment, uh, not having to be reactionary but proactive. It talks about them looking at Israel-Palestine as the key conflict of the region, despite all the mayhem that is happening around, and resolving it, therefore, will provide a positive rebel effect uh, for uh, the region. And I believe the first administration, the first Obama administration, has seen uh, uh, President Obama doing it by the book. The first week he announced that Israel-Palestine is a priority. He goes to Cairo and the famous speech of 2009. He picks a mediator that is neither close to the Arabs or to the Israelis. And he decides that this is a priority. But then comes both the personal uh, 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 issue aside, both the policy issue aside, then came out the, the uh, American political scene. And it was very obvious for Mr. Obama and Mr. Kerry in the first administration, sorry, Mr. Obama and Mr. Kerry was not there yet, it was very obvious that the U.S. political scene, internal political scene, is not capable to carry the personal ambitions and the policy ambitions. And it was very obvious from the first administration that Mr. Netanyahu was capable to really engage Mr. Obama internally in Washington in ways that we have all witnessed. This led Mr. Kerry to really learn the lesson. And then he came to us with a new approach. Let's not talk about frameworks. Let's not talk about settlement freeze. Let's just start a process that will create an animal on its own. That was the idea, an animal of its own life. And that animal of its own life will really, really have its own dynamics and momentum. And he jumped into the ring, Mr. Kerry. And what happened was very, after nine months, I think he jumped into Netanyahu's ring. You know what happened? He said the word boof, and boof was after the announcement of a, a series of settlement building and the process ending ended regrettably in failure. Khaled, we have to put very quickly in half a minute this whole nine month initiative in the larger context of the Oslo peace process. We've been living this negotiation for more than 20 years, 21 years to be precise. And if we place it there, we will find out that this process has been almost designed to prevent the outcome a process that serves as a cover-up. Practically speaking, if I give you some numbers, you would know that you start a process with 100,000 settlers and you end today with 600,000, then this is a process certainly that has managed to manage the conflict rather than resolve it. A process in a way that has led to delay Israel's moment of choice because we are talking and we are negotiating. So Israel neither is going to uh, annex the land nor it will going to end its occupation. And therefore, we will have two Palestinians now revisit this whole thing genuinely, seriously, with our international partners. And I think there are three things, and here I'll end. There are three things that we are doing as we speak. 
and we should continue doing. The first is to redefine negotiations. Negotiations is never about the principles. I was at the Kennedy School for several years, learning and teaching negotiations, and I, thought, I don't think you ever negotiate principles. You negotiate the modalities of implementing the principles. And in fact, the 1988 Palestinian Declaration of Independence and ipso facto recognizing Israel as a state on 78% of historic Palestine was not a call for negotiations, was coming to terms with partition. And it was, in effect, a call for implementation. Who was to implement this? The United States of America. And therefore, we have to go back to that, to that idea and that approach that negotiations is about finding the best flexible modalities for implementation, not about the principles. And this is something we are doing now. The second thing, we must let de-link, absolutely de-link negotiations from other major strategic tracks that are the rights of the Palestinian people. There is no contradiction between negotiations and the United Nations, and so I see Robert Sayre just arriving. Our, our quest in the UN is our right. It's a Palestinian right to go seek international legitimacy and a place in the international system and employ international instruments for the protection of our right. No contradiction. And that's exactly why President Mahmoud Abbas signed the 15 uh, documents treaties when we were still in the nine-month period to declare that there is no such contradiction. And should we negotiate in the future, we will continue on the track of the United Nations. The second delinking is between negotiations and reconciliation. The Palestinian-Palestinian reconciliation and reinstating a Palestinian inclusive democratic system serves the cause of peace and does not contradict with any track of negotiations. And that's why we also agreed on forming a national unity government three days before the end, and Dr. Mustafa al-Barghouti was in Gaza cooking that deal, three days before the end of the nine-month uh, negotiation uh, period. The last, this is the second point, delinking. The last point is that while we have failed for 20 years to get the negotiable issues sorted, meaning borders, settlements, Jerusalem, refugees, we have also been deprived of focusing on the non-negotiable issues. And now is the time to really pick again the non-negotiable issues. My right of self-determination is non-negotiable. How, how can I prove it? It has never been part of Oslo or part of any agreement with the successive Israeli government. My right of self-determination is enshrined. It's a birthright. My right to declare a state is by definition unilateral. Said who that I have to negotiate my right? to declare a state. Israel didn't consult the Palestinians, or America didn't consult the Brits. It's by definition unilateral. My right to seek international legitimacy, my right to work, to move, my right to access my own resources that has been stolen are non-negotiable. And therefore, if we fail to focus on the, or get achievements in the negotiable side, we will focus on the non-negotiable uh, side. With that, I will end my... Uh, Hussam, let me press you a little bit, because uh, you spoke very passionately, very eloquently, um, and and clearly you uh, you outline sort of the major flaws in this process uh, as well as its sponsors but my question to you is what part of the failure of this process does your leadership own right if you're talking about self-determination you're also talking about decisions that were made by the this Palestinian leadership to engage in this process not only in 1993 but well into 2014. So what part of the failure does uh, the Palestinian leadership own, and what are the implications of this failure for Palestinian politics in general? And then we'll... There has been a Palestinian uh, failure, and there is an element of uh, Palestinian homework uh, to be done. On, on the one hand, not continuing on a process that you know structurally is, is faulty for 20 years. It's almost, almost, I'll have to be absolutely blunt and, and frank here, it's it almost, the metaphor here is that you are in a casino and you're gambling. And each time you lose, you want to go back to gamble again as if you might win what you lost and you have been losing and losing again because the casino is owned by, by the US and the casino is designed to make you lose. It's, as I said, it's a process. Now, where we should, have, uh, we should have stopped, I think we should have stopped in 1997 when Netanyahu was elected and when he came up with a, with a platform clearly saying that he goes for the Greater Israel Project. We should have stopped there. Uh, again, uh, the leadership decided to continue on the path of international diplomacy on the various numerous U.S. Uh, initiatives. Also, our internal scene. 
our internal scene, there are two sides to it. Our united political representation is the absolute strongest weapon we have as Palestinians. You know, the Syrians are trying to unite their front right now with a lot of difficulties. The Libyans and what have you. The establishment of the PLO was the most genius Palestinian thing. And therefore, we had a lot to do to unite ourselves. And I'm so delighted that this latest round of reconciliation happened with all the obstacles. I believe it's a train that has left the station and it's irreversible. Thirdly, is our economic developmental situation. We haven't done well because of the complexity of the occupation and because of the theft of the land and the resources. But today, we really do have to look at our economic well-being as part of our struggle, resistance, resilience, steadfastness, and as part of our non-negotiable rights. The, the fact that I call for my right in the Dead Sea and the potash of the Dead Sea, or my gas in the shore of Gaza, or the resources I have is not economic peace. This is economic intifada. And today, we really have to watch our home affairs, our internal home affairs, and make sure that our, our, our people can steadfast on the land, because in the end, the battle is about every individual, every household, every school, every university we have. This morning, I woke up at the news of destroying another home in Jerusalem. We have to stay in the land, and we have to start really thinking that nonviolence pays. This is not just because of a moral consideration, but it's a very effective tool. And if you think what is available for us in the moral, political, and legal arena, it's immense. Let's neutralize Israel's huge weapon arsenal in the nuclear sense, and let us really engage them where it hurts, which is primarily the political, diplomatic, moral, and and legal arena, and I think this is where we're going, Khalid. Okay, I want to. You raised a lot of issues, and I want to pick up on on one strain that you mentioned. But before I do, um, I, I neglected to mention that this uh, uh, this event is being uh, covered live by uh, Al, Al Jazeera Mubasher. So we have a much broader audience than those who are in the room. We're very pleased uh, to have them join the conversation. Um, uh, Mustafa, if I might, I might ask you on the question of reconciliation, um, Sam spoke eloquently about Palestinian unity, and you uh, were involved uh, quite extensively in the process that led to the various reconciliation agreements and, and this most recent one. So let me ask you, uh, as you know, there are a lot of people who are skeptical. Why is this time different, uh, or why has it been different? Is it different? Is this latest reconciliation uh, agreement going to hold? All right, thank you. Well, uh, first of all, let me say that uh, uh, I definitely agree with the fact that uh, we are having a very serious crisis today uh, because negotiations have failed and uh, there has to be an alternative strategy. And that's, that's, that's why I think the issue of unity is a very important component of an alternative strategy that we need. There is a very big problem. Of course, we know that uh, Mr. Kerry has made a lot of efforts, and for efforts, he deserves A plus for sure. The problem is what was achieved, and uh, the problem is uh, that we are facing a failure mainly because of two reasons. One reason is the imbalance of power between us and Israel, and that needs to be fixed. And second, uh, it's because of the presence of this extreme Israeli government, which has become a government of settlers uh, to a large extent. So uh, to fix the imbalance of power, one of the very important and major factors is the issue of having unity between Palestinians. We cannot remain divided. And we cannot continue to watch the situation where the peace process itself has become a substitute to peace, or the peace process itself has become a way of maintaining status quo, which is very suitable for an occupation that has become the longest in modern history with 47 years, and that has transformed practically, uh, and I know that the Israelis don't like to hear that, but that's a fact of life, and it's repeated by so many politicians, including Israeli politicians themselves. This occupation has transformed practically into a full-fledged system of apartheid. Actually, a much worse system of apartheid and segregation than the one that prevailed in South Africa at one point of time. So unity is a, is a must, and we need it. 
But uh, unity, we are now facing a challenge because I'm sure those who are following the news notice that there are problems still, and uh, some problems are arising today in Gaza. And uh, that's why for us the challenge is that we need to maintain the unity not as a way of managing the division, but as a way of ending the division between Palestinians. Uh, in a much similar way to what was said by Hussam in a, a moment ago, that we don't need to manage the conflict, we need to end the conflict. So uh, the same applies here. Why did we move this time forward more than before? I think it's due to several factors. One factor is definitely the feeling of both Fatah and Hamas that the public is very angry at this division and that they would both pay a high political price if this division continues. Maybe not immediately, maybe in one month, maybe in one year, but it definitely I think they both feel that there is a very serious political price to be paid. Uh, second, I think uh, both parties have finally realized that they were struggling over an, an authority without authority, an authority under occupation. So I think, and I'm not saying everybody in each of these movements believe in that, but I think many of their leaders have realized that instead of fighting over leftover of an authority from an occupation that is still in control, it's better to get unified to get rid of the occupation itself. Uh, but there, is a, there, are, there are several other factors, of course, but I think these are uh, the most important ones. Probably the failure of negotiations was a contributing factor. Probably the regional changes in Egypt, in Syria, and in many places was also, were also re, uh, serious factors. But the challenge here that is facing us today is how do we really make this agreement, unity agreement, a myth, uh, an instrument or a bridge to ending this internal division. And here comes the biggest challenge that I think these parties are facing and Palestinian society in general is facing. And it's not different at all from the challenges that Arab communities face in various Arab countries. And that is the question of democracy. We cannot have a sustainable and sustained unity without accepting the principles of democracy. And that means accepting uh, the fact that there is no place in our time today for one party rule or one man rule or one group rule. It's a basic concept that, that has not been absorbed and that requires to be absorbed in our modern times. If we don't move further in the direction of accepting the principle of sharing political space, sharing responsibility, sharing decision making, if we don't accept the basic principles of freedom of political movement and freedom of organization and freedom of expression, this unity could collapse. And as a person who's heading the so-called Freedom Committee, I was chosen by all groups, all parties to head this committee, uh, we face a lot of problems and we issued what we call the Freedom Charter, the charter of 11 points which is, in my opinion, the implementation of which is very essential if we want to sustain this unity and if we want to keep it alive. But that's only one part, accepting democratic system. Democratic system would mean you accept the right of every party to run, and each party would have to accept the results of these elections eventually when they happen. But that's only one side of the matter. The other side is the fact that we are under occupation still. And we haven't become free yet. And we don't really have a state up till now. We have a decision to be recognized as a state that's very powerful and very important. But we are still under occupation. That means we are not an authority. We are still a liberation movement. And that means we need this unity, but it cannot continue without having a common strategy, an agreed upon strategy. And when I speak about strategy, I mean an, an agreed upon unified strategy that provides a unified political stand 
when it comes, for instance, to issues like going to negotiations or not going to negotiations, which agreements you can accept and which one you don't accept, you need a, a unified platform to accept that and or refuse it. And second, we need to agree about what forms of struggle we have to conduct. And it has to be a, a national unified decision. Uh, I think popular nonviolent resistance is becoming now the most dominant and the most effective way, but it requires an overall consensus about going in that path. Uh, so an, in my opinion, the future depends, and the future of unity depends on these two elements, accepting democracy, accepting sharing power, accepting sharing everything together, accepting having a space for everybody, and having a unified strategy. Now, what we've managed to achieve was unexpected. Most people thought we were going to fail. When we went to Gaza, uh, many people thought this is not going to succeed. But we surprised everybody, not because it was only a good luck, but because we did very good preparation before going to Gaza. And we went through all these issues. Now we have a unified government, but we still have economic issues to be resolved. We have the problem of Gaza employees. We have to move forward and convene the, uh, the interim leadership uh, meeting of, uh, which is supposed to reform the PLO and initiate that process. We have to convene the Palestinian Legislative Council, and that is a very important issue, and also prepare for elections, and that should be democratic, uh, and that allows uh, participation of everybody. I want here to say one very last word about the relationship of Israel to this unity agreement. We know that Israeli position today is isolated. And that's an achievement because the world community accepted the national unity government uh, or the technocratic government, let's call it, because it's not really a unity government. It's a, a technocratic government consisting of independent professionals, basically. And uh, it is agreed upon. It's a consensus government rather than a unity government. And that's an important point. I was alerted to that uh, in dealing with, the, with how the Congress in the United States is, is reacting to it. But let me say that this unity has brought us closer, in my opinion, to the possibility of peace. Because it takes away that whole argument that you cannot make peace with Palestinians because they are divided. And the awkward position that Mr. Netanyahu finds himself in is in the fact that before we had unity, he kept claiming that you can't make peace with Palestinians because they are divided. And when we got unified, he started saying you can't make peace with Palestinians because they are unified. So in my opinion, it's very important to understand that unity brings us closer to the possibility of peace because any agreement would be with all Palestinians and not just with part of them. But then comes the very important point too. When we speak about reconvening the Legislative Council, it's about ending a situation where practically all authorities were concentrated in the hands of two executive authorities, one in the West Bank and one in Gaza. Bringing back the Palestinian parliament to life is about bringing back what we have lost, the, the system of democracy, at least what we've managed to build of it. A system of accountability, a system of separation of power, where in the, there is independence of the judiciary system, of the legislative power, etc., etc. So these are very important points to remember why we have been so consistent and so determined to have this uh, unity, not only because it serves the interest of the whole Palestinian population, but in my opinion, it is the only way to step forward into the future. Uh, thank you. Um, let me... Let me uh you mentioned all the need for alternative strategies. You talked about a lot of issues that I want to come back to, but let me focus in on this one. When you say an alternative strategy, what exactly are you referring to? Alternative to negotiations, I presume, is what you mean. Um, what are the alternatives to negotiations in the two-state context? How can Palestinians achieve a state uh, independent of negotiations? Well, in reality, why did negotiations fail? First of all, because Israel continued to build settlements, in my opinion. This is the first very important point. And it was allowed to continue to build settlements. And uh, during the negotiations period, which is nine months, uh, 14,000 new units were established. And after negotiations stopped, of course, they built 
or they, start, they declared 3,500 3, new units as well. So the very difficult situation lies in the fact that physically speaking, it is very hard to know or measure whether we have crossed or we might be about to cross the red line of irreversibility because of settlement building. We're not talking only about illegal settlements being built on occupied territories. We're talking about a whole matrix of settlement building, more than 600 military checkpoints, a big wall that is, uh, that is depriving hundreds of thousands of Palestinians from normal life and practically annexing big part of the land. We're talking about a whole system of laws that are different, one for Jewish Israeli people and one for Palestinians. We're talking about the privation of our right to have water, access to water, etc., etc. When you all unsegregated roads, would, which never existed even in the apartheid system in South Africa, when you put that matrix together, you start asking the question, how can you build a state there? And so in our opinion, we are not against negotiations in principle. We tried that for 21 years. But if negotiations continue while settlements continue to grow, believe me, then negotiations would be nothing but a cover for status quo and a cover for killing the possibility of two-state solution. And that's why I think we cannot move forward without having an alternative option. And in my opinion, that alternative option is, should be built on a strategy of four components. One is popular nonviolent resistance which has to be expanded and improved and developed. And it, there are very good examples of that, regardless of the severe violence that is practiced against Palestinians by the Israeli army. Second, it's unity. And when I speak, by the way, about popular nonviolent resistance, I am uh, repeating or uh, responding to what Mr. Obama, President Obama himself said in his Cairo speech when he called on Palestinians to follow the examples of Gandhi and Martin Luther King. That's the kind and the model which, in my opinion, will be very effective. But second, it's the unity, maintaining the unity. And third, it's the, it's the, the, the boycott, divestment, sanctions campaigns that are growing worldwide and that are presenting a very powerful pressure point on Israel. And if Israel continues its policy and does not find a way of changing this government that they have, they will definitely face a serious growth of that kind of movement. But finally, and that's a very important point, I think for an alternative strategy, we definitely need an alternative economic approach, an economic policy that does not continue to inflate and expand the public sector in a way that is making the Palestinians so dependent on foreign aid, uh, uh, an economic policy that uh, opens opportunities for young, young people, that encourages in private enterprise and encourages initiatives, entrepreneurial approach, uh, a, a policy, an economic policy that takes care of those who are threatened to be dismissed and, and um, ethnically cleansed, basically, in, in certain areas uh, in Area C. Uh, basically, an economic policy that helps people survive under these difficult circumstances. In my opinion, these components represent an alternative strategy to failing negotiations because it's very important for Israel and for the world to know that Palestinians have alternatives. The issue of one state, two states, we can talk about it later, maybe. <laughs> it's another important issue on which I think uh, there might, the, the national consensus is beginning to fray, if not already um, eroded uh, significantly. Um, uh, Omar, I wanted to pick up on uh, this theme of reconciliation and unity and you as a Gazan, what does Palestinian unity and reconciliation look like from Gaza, uh, which of course has been under uh, blockade from both the Egyptian and the Israeli side, and, um, uh, but also Gaza being a population of, uh, majority of them are refugees. Um, which is another component to this peace process or to this conflict that has been uh, frequently neglected. So what does reconciliation mean uh, from a Gaza standpoint on, on 
if you allow me to clarify on two, uh, two basic components really to, to my question. Is this a real reconciliation or is this simply a deal between the two dominant factions, Hamas and Fatah, where in which we've exchanged a monopoly, a Fatah monopoly, uh, for a duopoly of Hamas and Fatah? to the exclusion of, uh, or to the detriment at least, of, of other uh, political uh, third parties or independents and, and, and others. Um, and the second component, does this question of, of unity put to rest once and for all any questions about the legitimacy of the Palestinian leadership? Was it solely a matter of, of Palestinian unity uh, and hence now we have a fully legitimate Palestinian leadership? Thank you, Khalid. And, uh, let me express my happiness to be in Qatar for the first time. Uh, I'm going to speak in Arabic so I can make myself more clearer. Uh, at the beginning, I, I would like to express my... Uh, I'm so pleased to be uh, at the Sif Qatar. I would like to thank the Amir, Qatar Amir, for uh, 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 helping the Gaza Strip especially the, the issue of uh, electricity blackout. As you know that Gaza, the area is 360 square kilometers. It's part of the Palestinian territories and where uh, the, uh, the population is 1.5 million Palestinian will be uh, based on the UN Gaza 2020, where will be, uh, be two, uh, two million uh, people where based on the proportion between the population and the area, we will have, it to, we will have about 500. Gaza Strip is a need for 500 schools. And there is a true crisis in, in water and the health and seven years of uh, siege and division, which uh, actually pushed uh, Gaza Strip uh, 20 years back. You know that Gaza contributes 20 percent of the Palestinian uh, exports and about 30 percent of the Palestinian GDP. 60 percent of the residents of uh, Gaza are youth. Uh, two thirds of those youth are below 30, haven't left Gaza Strip at all. And uh, what uh, actually bothers me uh, in terms of the peace agreement, uh, we need to make a distinction between peace agreement and peace culture. We might have peace agreement, but the peace culture is far fetched. 20 years ago, or at the end of 90s, at the early stage of the Palestinian authorities, where the growth rate was 9% and the employment rate was 16%. There was uh, the per rate of employment in Palestine was just like uh, states uh, or Germany, where about 5,000 Israeli, they used to sleep two nights at Ga in Gaza, and there was a mutual recognition between both sides, and there was a recognition of the peace culture and there was acceptance so that's why we need to need to work hard to bring back the confidence between both nations and not just in the Palestinian territories but uh, in Israel that the Israeli people need to, to know that they can't live without a permanent solution you know Gaza is, uh, is five kilometers away from uh, Israel where the residents of Gaza they can see the lights of Israel and the world is just the, this war which has, was built is not just against uh, Palestinian people but against Israel too. Some is, is some people in Israel believe that they can live for the next 100 years without a permanent resolution. Resolution. So the the, the uh, reconciliation is the uh, is the exit. With there are thousands of uh, sick people who are suffering from the siege, and we have thousands of uh, students who lost. Uh, uh, their seats uh, and in different universities, about 15,000 uh, uh, marriage cases, well, 5,000 uh, newly born baby. We need 25,000 uh, residential units annually. So Gaza is living in a crisis and disaster, and it needs an early intervention. And we have contacted UN agencies informing that each day, each day of uh, siege will require th one year of uh, intervention. So this reconciliation should have ha took a place long time ago. Uh, this reconciliation would require a lot of, uh, not only financial support, but also psychological support. I'm one of those involved in the reconciliation, and we have witnessed those two wars two Israeli wars on Gaza that destroyed the infrastructure and this, these two wars destroyed the Palestinian social fabrics. 
So this reconciliation is a salvation for the Palestinian people to move forward to the future. And I believe the national unity uh, government will prevent extremism and, and eradicate poverty. Although Gaza Strip is a small uh, uh, area, but it will solve a lot of uh, issues in the region. There are so many issues that uh, th are discussed after seven years of division between Hamas and, and PLO, and also we need to identify the relationship between PLO and the Palestinian Authority. One of the key challenges that we faced, as we faced and the Palestinian Authority faced, and when we criticize the Palestinian Authority, we are we need to redefine the authority's role as the as the bearer of the uh, responsibility for establishing a Palestinian state. We are required to work on three legitimacies, legitimacies because there are a, a mixture, a confusion between the parliamentary legitimacy and revolutionary legitimacy. You know, the Palestinian Authority, we have four million Palestinian people, where also we have eight million people living outside who are not fully representative in, internally. And during, even, even during the 60s, we see that the Palestinian have only their revolutionary legitimacy, which actually ended when the authority was established. And the PLO, we need to make a distinction between the PLO that represents the Palestinian internally and externally, uh, all over the world. And we have the National Palestinian Authority that will represent the Palestinians in, in the West Bank and Gaza and East Jerusalem and, and Fatah movement, which was the biggest uh, Palestinian movement, and that needs to be reformed. So that's why we make a distinction between these three entities or institutions. Uh, President Mahmoud Abbas is the head of these three entities. There was a problem in terms of the integration between Fatah, the PLO, and the authorities, just like what we see between the integration between Hamas and its government. Mr. Hania, Mr. Hania, Khad Hania. He's the head of the political bureau. That's why the, the, we need to renew the legitimacy of the, also the Palestinian regime is getting old. The, the age of those, the members of the Palestinian authorities are eight years. So that's why there's a discrepancy between the age of those who are leading the authority and the young people. With, with all due respect to their struggle and their achievement, because the you, young people are the sacrifice of the internal fights and they are the victims of the marginalization. The third issue, when the PLO was established, we did not have what you call this political Islam. There are a lot of Palestinian movement uh, that affiliated, affiliated to the PLO that it doesn't have any uh, influence on the ground. I'm not representing any of this movement, but the Palestinian uh, political system need to express uh, accurately and represent the cha political and intellectual changes that took place to the Palestinian society or community. Uh, what I what I heard is in some part there is a difference between the Sulta, the Palestinian Authority, and the PLO. And so my question then to you is. Why has the focus been exclusively on this technocratic government, which, as we all know, it seems to me that there is a bit of doublespeak on the part of both opponents and uh, those who support this reconciliation deal. Uh, this reconciliation was important for Palestinian national unity and so on, and yet, as you mentioned, only the Palestinian Authority has jurisdiction over only one-third of, of the Palestinian population. And as we know, P the PLO is the political address of the Palestinian people, including, and you might even say, especially given the history of the PLO, uh, the diaspora. And the PLO, of course, is an institution that was born uh, in the refugee camps and among uh, uh, the, in, in the Palestinian diaspora. So how can we, on the one hand, talk about legitimacy in terms of a technocratic government that is essentially not political and will certainly not be taking up these issues of refugees and Jerusalem, won't be negotiating. And yet there's been very little progress 
uh, on, on the institution that actually matters, which is the PLO. Um, so my question to you is, is it time to reform the PLO? Uh, or is it time to replace the PLO? And if it's time to reform, how do, how do we go about doing that? Yes, no doubt we need to reform it, not to replace it. Uh, or it is, uh, it, is, uh, it is a movement that was established in the 60s that represented the Palestinians, but the PLO became part of the uh, Palestinian Authority. And the PLO has a line budget, uh, which actually which make the Palestinian outside lose their uh, true representation uh, entirely. What we are required to uh, reflect on the process and to reform the whole political system in parallel with the negotiation with the Israelis. We need to continue our struggles in order to f realize our dream. But if we want to be capable, we need to reform our internal system and to reform the health and other sectors because the the political and social and economical indicators are negative. 20 years back, we were much better than now, in spite of the international aid. This is based on UN reports and the World Bank reports that the Palestinian territories are poorer than what's thought to be. I can give the statistics in this uh, regard. I believe the basic step is to go for parliamentary and presidential election as soon as possible uh, in order to establish and create a political system that will consider the changes that happen. I talk about uh, parliament and the presidency, and to allow the persons who lives outside to vote in a creative manner. In the refugee camps in Lebanon and Syria. I know it's somehow difficult to, to see such an election outside, like Jordan, for example. That's why we need to look for creative, uh, creative ideas and mechanisms, either through creating a general assembly in jo Lebanon or Jordan or Argentina. Those Palestinians need to be given the opportunity, opportunity to draw the Palestinian political system. None of us, we are a minority in the Palestinian territories. We don't, we don't have the right to take a decision to end the conflict without being consulting those who are living outside. There are so many ideas that we can embrace in this particular uh, aspect, and that's why I don't want to jump to a conclusion, but why don't we discuss uh, organizing a general assembly that might be held in uh, Egypt on, or, or in Jordan or Europe, where we, we can discuss the future of Palestinian cause and the international uh, funding. We have, we, there are a lot of rich Palestinians who are willing to contribute to establishment and development there of Palestine. We don't want to be trapped, and we don't heavily rely on the international aids. We need to answer a key question, an essential question related to the survival of the Palestinian national project. We'll come back to all of these issues, so please just hold on to, the, to those thoughts. Um, but let's, let's round out the discussion um, before we bring it back around with uh, our, our final speaker, um, uh, Dr. Dejani, um, sort of shifting gears a little bit, you know, we covered, or at least we talked about uh, issues of refugees and Palestinian political institutions and this faction and that faction, um, and of course the conflict with Israel and the peace process. But I think one thing that doesn't actually get discussed a lot is, uh, especially in conflicts, is the psychological component of uh, of conflicts. And this is an issue I think that you've dealt with uh, extensively and that you have personal experience with. You recently uh, came back from a trip in which you took uh, 20 or so Palestinian students uh, on a trip to Auschwitz, the notorious uh, Nazi death camp uh, in Poland. Uh, and uh, were you surprised by the reaction that you received? Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Dr. Dezeni was uh, was demonized and was um, targeted personally, I think, uh, and in fact uh, was forced to leave his, his job at uh, Al-Quds University. So tell us a little bit about that experience, why you thought it was important to understand a Jewish or Israeli narrative, uh, and if you can, to the extent that you can, maybe shed light on, uh, on the sort of 
response that you received, if you can ex help us understand why Palestinians, uh, or so many Palestinians, responded so negatively. Uh, let me begin by giving some, a little bit background. Uh, we live in a Can world I ask you, I'm sorry, if you could bring the microphone a little bit closer and speak okay. a little bit louder. Uh, we live in a world which is a world of images, of perceptions. And uh, the problem is that when uh, the perceptions become realities, when it becomes our reality, so uh, because then it will uh, determine our behavior. Before uh, Oslo, uh, we had a simple formula. The other is our enemy, he is our mortal enemy, and uh, our struggle is to liberate Palestine. And so that's why the PLO, Palestine Liberation Organization, and uh, as such, it was either us or them. It was a simple formula. Israel is a dagger in the Arab world, and as it's an imperialist implant, and as a result, it has to go. So basically, that was the culture we lived in. We did not know anything about Israel, and at the same time, we thought that the Arab armies will just give us an excuse, and Israel will be wiped out by the Arab armies. The 1967 was an awakening call in which uh, we woke up to a new realities that we live in a technological world where technology is very important at the same time where diplomacy and also international relations uh, determine power. Um, and so our perception started to shift a little. Unfortunately, our knowledge did not uh, grow and uh, our education uh, was in shambles, did not uh, uh, improve the way we, we live, the way we think. Uh, Oslo made a difference. Though people disregard Oslo and uh, don't consider it uh, part of the history, but it was, I believe, the most important uh, turning point in this struggle. Why? Because before Oslo, it was a simple formula of Arabs against Israel or Palestinians against Israel. After Oslo, the whole transformation of the psychology became that it was Palestinians and Israelis uh, for peace against Palestinians and Israelis against peace. So it was two camps which were actually, uh, they were uh, joined by the other. And so the perception now totally became different. And as a result, uh, we thought of the other, we started to transform our image of the other. Uh, I call uh, this the big dream, small hope formula or model in which uh, before, before Oslo, uh, we thought of the big dream where actually uh, it's a quote from Mahmoud Darwish in which he says, what is, a more, what is more important, a big dream or a small hope? And so what is the big dream for Israelis is to wake up one morning and there are no Palestinians. What is the big dream for Palestinians to wake up one morning and there are no Israelis? Now the question is, uh, uh, are we going to throw them in the sea or are they going to throw us in the desert? And the, uh, how, how can it be done? Should it be done? Is it morally accepted? Will the world accept it? So here the military option was out, and so the diplomatic option became the more important uh, factor in this in resolving this conflict. So here, uh, my role as a teacher was how can we uh, break taboos? Uh, in the beginning, uh, which I started back in 2002, the American Studies Program at Al-Quds University, and the idea was how to how should we as Palestinians look at the United States? Yani, our look was very simple. Uh, Israel is the enemy. America supports Israel, so America is the enemy. So that was simple perception to America and everything America did uh, was uh, uh, viewed totally negative. And uh, as a result, I wanted to introduce, uh, to break this taboo uh, in teaching Palestinians that America is not foreign policy, it's not, and so there is much more to America than the foreign policy, and so we started this MA program at Al-Quds University in order to 
uh, break this taboo about the United States. And at this time, it was not well received. I was criticized that I'm recruiting for the CIA or that it is, although the United States did not support the program that much. However, it was a very important program because it helped Palestinians actually expand their view about the world. And then in 2007, there was another taboo that I wanted to break, which is Islam and religion, in which uh, Hamas in 2006 was elected. However, uh, people, Hamas, when Hamas ran for the elections, it raised three slogans, change, reform, and transparency and accountability. That was very good, and so it got, it got elected on these slogans. However, after the elections, uh, rather than adopt the national agenda of peace and reconciliation, it adopted its own agenda of no uh, recognition, armed struggle, and uh, no negotiations. So we, we started from where we left with Fatah. And uh, however, and that's why I thought that uh, it was important to start a movement that will call for moderation. The Palestinian uh, political uh, uh, theater is that it is divided into three uh, sectors. There is on the, on the right, you have 10 parties, political parties. They are religious and they don't believe in uh, negotiating for peace with Israel. And then in the middle, there is the around 70% of the uh, people uh, who are moderate. And then there is on the left around 40 uh, to 45 uh, political secular parties. So basically in 1996, the middle voted for Fatah to be elected to the left. And in 2006, the middle voted for Hamas. So basically the struggle is always for the middle. Here we have a small minority that is dominating the theater where they claim they speak on behalf of the majority. Hamas, when it was elected, was not elected because of its agenda. It was elected because of its Islamic orientation. And so a vote for Hamas was a vote for Islam. Here, this is where actually I felt it's so important that we try to, uh, uh, try to extract religion out of politics because in the last two decades there has been religion became used, exploited to, for political agendas. The, then actually also part of breaking the taboos was education. How can we, uh, how can we make images uh, and reality separate uh, and so be able to look at the reality? One of the, th one of the taboos in Palestinian society is how we look at the Holocaust. And so we cannot understand the psyche of the Holocaust uh, in the Israeli mind. At the same time, the Israelis do not understand the psyche of the Nakba in the Palestinian mind. So actually, when a Palestinian looks at the Holocaust and sees in it, uh, and looks at the images of the Holocaust and sees people behind bars, then immediately he thinks of the Palestinians behind bars and try to transpose the Holocaust on the Nakba and tries to compare the Nakba with the Holocaust. And there is a lot of denial that there existed a Holocaust. And here, unless we understand what the Holocaust means in the cycle of the other, we cannot have reconciliation. So the Jew looked at the Holocaust and he looks at the big, big, he zooms on the big picture because he looks at what was planned to be the final solution to end them as a whole, as a people. And so in this way, uh, to him, it is a very touchy, sensitive topic. And so I, f I felt it is very important for us as Palestinians in order to be able to build peace and to build reconciliation uh, with the other that we un try to understand the, where the other is coming from in order to build trust with the other because without trust, there can be no, no reconciliation, no, no peace. And that's why actually we look at the negotiations and we, we find a lot of psychological problems there. And to, to take, for instance, the issue of uh, 
the Jewish state, recognizing the issue of the Jewish state. Actually, it's a new issue on the table. And uh, when it was thrown by Netanyahu, President Abbas said, yes, we have recognized Israel. Whether Israel wants to be a Jewish state or not, that's up to them. And so, and suddenly, the Israelis and some of the Palestinians started to say, wait a minute, this Jewish issue, what is it about? Uh, oh, it means denial of Palestinian right of return, denial this, denial that. And so it became, it uh, mushroomed and became a big issue. And then suddenly we do not recognize the Jewish state. And it became one of the basic issues on the table. Other issues and many other issues like this are psychological. They understand our psychology and they deal with, that li with us like this. Yeah, and for instance, in 1947, the Jews did not want the partition plan because it denied them uh, a lot of space, a lot of area. However, they accepted it so, th so that we rejected. And we played that game. Because they accepted it, then it is good for them. And so we rejected it. And ever since, they have been manipulating us with this. And so basically, you look at, the, uh, you, you look at uh, issues and we lose one opportunity after the other. So Abba Iban once said, uh, coined this phrase, Palestinians never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity, even if these opportunities are good. Kerry came with a plan. We should have, instead of saying no, 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 we should have said yes, but. Okay, yes, we'll accept, but let us discuss. But our, our, uh, our uh, uh, we were more targeting to the masses which actually were very skeptical. And so we said, no, 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 rather than saying, OK, let's take it for a deal. Let's take it and let's discuss it. So here, the issue is uh, psychological. And we, uh, we need to have a culture that actually, rather than the culture of conflict, to move from the culture of conflict to the, to the culture of reconciliation. And how we do that? It is actually by breaking taboos, by moving to the center, because the center is not yet, did not collapse yet. And here, and uh, third, also not to allow the minority to rule the majority. In Israel, which claims it's a democracy, yet small parties dominate the scene who are not elected by the people to be a majority. In Palestine, similar, uh, similar things. If you want to be creative, if you want to bring new ideas, then you are labeled as a traitor. We are surrounded by a mentality of the 50s in which Nicola Durr wrote his book, his very famous book that became a classic in the Arab world in the 50s and 60s about the role of the gun and the oil and the petroleum in liberating Palestine. So it was a gun. He was talking about the gun, the Madfa, rather than when we had intercontinental missiles. So basically here, we have, in the Arab world, we have published one, uh, 2,000 books about the United States throughout our history. Half of them are translated, and the other half are written by those people who did not visit America or do not know much about the United States. Yet, in the United States, they have 100,000 books about horses, or about cats, or about, uh, about baseball. Now, the major power in the world, and we don't know anything about it, and still we are experts in the field of the United States. So this is where I believe that we need to cross this uh, bridge and to try to see how we can move from a culture of, uh, of conflict to a culture of peace or reconciliation. The Israelis, uh, between 1990 till 2000, $20 million were spent on people-to-people -people activities, while the Israelis built a wall for more than $3 billion, a wall that means nothing. But psychologically, they claim it gives them security. While if Gaza, if there are tunnels in Gaza that move cars, how come that we cannot have a tunnel under that wall? Uh, in order to move guns. But st still, psychologically speaking, Israelis believe that it was the wall that gave them security, which is not true. And so here, I believe, we have inherited this conflict from our grandparents. It is our 
moral duty to work for peace so that uh, we can have our grandchildren inherit peace and, re and prosperity. Thank you. If I could, and I, uh, I just want to put to you a, a follow-up question to maybe clarify something, and then we'll come back. I want to give the panelists, uh, everyone, an opportunity to respond to the things that we heard before going to the audience. Um, but is there a question, uh, I think a lot of people would agree with the objective of a historical reconciliation between two parties in a conflict, and that understanding each side's suffering is important, um, but is it a question of sequence? Um, and so my question, I suppose, is why did you choose this particular moment when, um, when there was the Jewish state demand being made uh, at the time in, uh, in the negotiations, which a lot of Palestinians felt was negating their own historical narrative uh, and their own suffering? Um, and I suppose related to that, was your program, did it include uh, a component uh, on the other side in which you exposed Israelis to, uh, for example, destroyed Palestinian villages in Israel or, or sort of uh, raising awareness of the Nakba? Um, so I, I'm curious to know if, 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 you know, why you chose this particular moment in time um, and would it have made more sense maybe in the context of, a, of an agreement in which at least some Palestinian rights are restored and then at that point we can talk about historic reconciliation? Or is your view that historic reconciliation needs to happen before uh, other issues of the conflict have been addressed? Actually, actually this is a project between, uh, uh, it, it is a two-year-old project. It has, been, we, it has been in preparation for two years. So it has nothing to do with the present status. So basically, it is a project between uh, Frederick uh, Schiller University at Jena in Germany and um, Al Wasatiya because uh, Al Quds University uh, is not uh, working on joint projects, and Tel Aviv University and uh, Ben Gurion University. The idea was. Um, uh, that to take 30 Palestinian students to Auschwitz to study about the suffering of the other and uh, uh, to study how does empathy play a role in uh, reconciliation. At the same time, to take 30 Israeli students from Ben Gurion University to visit uh, Palestinian refugee camps and meet with uh, people from who lived the Nakba and to hear their stories and the, to be acquainted with their suffering and then study how does knowing about the suffering of the other affect, affect their uh, attitude towards reconciliation. So actually, uh, but it became very politicized by the media because uh, when the Israeli students came and uh, visited the refugee camps in uh, Beit Lahem and in uh, uh, Jerusalem, uh, the Daisha refugee camp and the Shafat refugee camp before our visit. Our visit did take place uh, and then uh, basically uh, the problem was that the media, Haaretz, published an article about the visit when the last day we were there, but when Al Quds newspaper uh, translated that article, it translated a sentence that said, accompanied by two Holocaust survivors, to say that it was funded by uh, two Jewish organizations, which actually was not true. It was funded by the uh, German Research Foundation. And at the same time, it made it look as if it's a political uh, gimmick by Zionism and by the Israeli uh, universities. So it incited people actually to be against the trip, against those who organized it, against people who, uh, who uh, participated in it. And so that was part of the problem. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I'd like to give you all an opportunity to respond to some of the things that you've heard. Uh, and, and, and in doing so, I'd ask you kindly uh, to please uh, be as brief as you can, because we have about 20 minutes left, I think, uh, in the entire session. And, and we'd like to have an opportunity to go to the audience. Uh, for some questions. So I believe uh, Mustafa and then Hussam wanted to make uh, some. Uh, 
It's very important that I uh, and you have heard uh, Dr. Mohammed uh, remarks, and I think it's very important for Palestinian students to go to uh, such a place of horror. Um, it's very important for Palestinians to absolutely recognize uh, the agony that the Jewish people have gone through in the Second World uh, War. Um, and I believe what President Mahmoud Abbas said very recently, that the Holocaust was one of the most uh, uh, heinous crimes of uh, modern history, is also important for us Palestinians. Because for a nation of ours not to associate with the suffering of another is a problem. However, uh, Mohammed, I see a, a serious uh, issue with the, uh, with the equating of the two experiences and with the symmetry of the whole uh, proposition. And it's very important to outline it. While the Holocaust is an is a unimaginable crime, it did not uh, happen because of any Palestinian involvement. It was a European Christian uh, phenomena par excellence that we condemn. Uh, while the Nakba is an Israeli perpetuation by excellence. That's number one. Number two, this whole logic of the last 25 years of doing business was based on this idea of symmetry between the two parties. It was called peacemaking. Peacemaking between whom? As if there are two equal parties, there are two countries, there are two armies, and we have some minor mute differences about some centimeters of land here and there. No, I'm sorry. That is not the situation. This is a misperception. Only if we understand each other, only if we can convince them a bit more. It's about ignorance. They don't know. We don't know. I'm sorry, in the, face, in the, in the age of the Facebook, don't talk to me about ignorance. In effect, in effect, this whole peacemaking thing has turned us, the Palestinians, in a state of limbo. Limbo. We are in a limbo now. If you go to the average American in the, uh, any street of uh, the US or in London or here and ask, summarize the Palestinian-Israeli situation in one sentence, they will not find it. We are a state, we are not a state, we are an authority, we are not an authority. Do we have a border? We don't have a border. All this was caused by this idea of equating between the two sides. No, there is an occupied and there is an occupier. There is a colonized and there is a colonizer. There is an army that is considered to be the fourth strongest, that is captiv captivating an entire nation, mostly civilian, mostly unarmed, and there is a nation that is trying to survive. Let's get the record very straight, and it's very important. That's number one. Number two, the Palestinian people, and this is by no means in the blame game, have really gone out in their way in trying to engage with the Jewish question, engage with the other, and I belong to the current thinking that while, while absolute justice Absolute justice means that we have to re revisit what happened in 1948. I go with the relative justice. I go with the relative justice. I go with the fact that there is a de facto presence of an Israeli people that were born in my home. I go with it. I cannot blame my father or my grandfather for rejecting a colonization project in the early last century. I can't blame them for rejecting to give up their homes voluntarily, can I? I can't. And equally so, I am thrilled that the Palestinian National Movement and the Palestinian society have come to terms with the fact of the relative justice. The problem with relative justice and the two-state solution is that of power relations. This is not about ignorance, Muhammad. This is not about even identity. It's about comfort. Why is Mr. Netanyahu doing this? Is it because of ideology? No. I believe because he's very comfortable. The limbo that we are in. The status quo, there is zero cost, thanks to us, the Palestinian Authority, thanks to the international community. It's a five-star occupation, seven-star occupation. You can even have room service if you want. There's a lot of profiteering, a lot of profiteering. 60% of the land, all the water, all the resources. The Jordan Valley alone generate more than $900 million, only dates. I mean, add to all that a culture of impunity. You can just simply get away with it. Have the cake and eat it. If you were in Mr. Netanyahu's shoes, I know I have to end, yeah. Why would you change? Why would you even consider to give up anything? Why? When you have Tel Aviv where there is a zero sense of crisis, those of you who go to Israel, we, the, you will feel zero sense of crisis. doesn't exist. Or sense of urgency. If you have an opinion poll and ask Israelis, do you want a two-state solution? 70% will tell you yes. If you ask a second question, when do you want it? Mm, doesn't matter. In 10 years, we are not in a rush. The question before us now is how do you create a bloodless, a bloodless, non-violent, 
peaceful sense of crisis. Without it, nothing can go. You'll have to cut me here. I wanted to touch upon one last thing. This is not about Judaism as, as a religion for the Palestinians of Muhammad. I was raised by a grandfather that made me look up to Judaism, that told me, eat with the Jew, stay with the Jew. This is about Judaization, Ya Muhammad. This is about turning religion into a dynamic form of stealing land. And our problem with the Jewish state issue and the recognition of Israel being the state of, for the Jewish people is turning us into the occupiers, it's turning us into the colonizers, it's turning us into the invaders, it's turning us into visitors in our own homeland. It's almost, almost giving Mr. Netanyahu a stamp of approval for continuing the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians. Uh, thanks, Hossam. Uh, Mustafa, do you want to make a, a point? Two main comments. One is uh, relevant to what Omar spoke about, and I totally agree with him, about uh, the PLO. Uh, you cannot, uh, the reconciliation agreement is not just about having elections for the president and the Palestinian Legislative Council. By the way, it could become elections for Palestinian parliament since we are a state now. This is an issue we are discussing today. But it's also about the elections of the Palestinian National Council. And uh, uh, this is important because when Mr. Abbas sits on a table of negotiations, as Mr. Arafat did before, he's not representing the Palestinian Authority. He's representing the PLO. And uh, that's why... Just to clarify, for those who don't know, the Palestinian National Council is the sort of parliament in exile of the PLO. Exactly. And, and that's why... Uh, we do understand that it might be impossible to conduct elections in, uh, in certain places, of course, and it might be impossible actually to have elections in, uh, in certain uh, countries. But that doesn't mean that we are not and should not be obliged to find a way of representing the Palestinians in a way that can be, uh, so that the PLO can really be a representative and can be empowered to represent Palestinians when it comes to very difficult and serious issues, like the issue of the right of refugees to return, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Otherwise, the, any any future agreement will many Palestinians will simply object to and say we did not we were not represented in, in this in this particular deal. Uh, one other element which I think Omar did very good job in describing, and I really thank him for that, is the issue of the generation gap. We have a serious generation gap between the Palestinian leadership and the, the Palestinian people. 80% of the Palestinian population today are below the age of 33. And 50% are below the age of 17. And there is a very serious dynamic of alienation. I know it's a worldwide phenomenon. People in general in the world are becoming alienated from politicians, but that's a, a different story. But here, uh, this can have very serious uh, uh, impact and can have very serious complications if it's not dealt with. Uh, I struggled very hard in the last meeting of the so-called interim leadership to pass a law, uh, to, to pass a, 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 an element in the law, an article that allows people to be elected uh, if they are at the age of 21 and more. And many people turned to me when we were discussing that in the meeting and said, well, you want to transform the Palestinian uh, National Council into a kindergarten. I, I then reminded them that uh, I had the occasion of meeting the youngest parliamentarian in Sweden. Uh, and uh, she was a young woman representing the Green Party there. And uh, when I asked her where she was from, it turned out she was from Gaza. So I said, if a young Palestinian Gazan who is 21 years old could be a member of the Swedish parliament, why cannot she be a member of the Palestinian parliament? So I'm just mentioning that because I think the issue of generation gap is a very serious matter and has to be taken into consideration. Now, my second point uh, is related to the fact that are several, there are several mistakes that are frequently made about the Palestinian-Israeli issue. And I ha I'm not going to discuss them or explain them. I'll just mention them. Uh, of course, I agree with what Hussam said regarding that the fact that you cannot, the first mistake is equating between the two sides. 
this, this is not helpful and it's not correct. I will not elaborate on that because he did. Second issue is that one suffering really does not justify another suffering. And while we do fully recognize, and I think it's important for Palestinians to understand the suffering of Jewish people, whether not only in the Holocaust, but also in the pogroms of Russia and during the time of Inquisition, this part of history is important for people to understand. But that by no means justify the suffering of the Palestinian people. Third point, the process, I repeat that, I know I mentioned it before, the process is not a substitute to the goal. The peace process cannot be a substitute to achieving peace or a solution. The fourth point is that avoiding or ignoring issues, as life has shown, will not make these issues disappear. So there are certain very important issues related to the Palestinian needs and Palestinian future that cannot be ignored. And finally, and this is not just a statement, but I think it's a fact of life that many people are realizing today. The only alternative to two-state solution is one-state solution. There is no other alternative. Apartheid, a system of segregation, stupid dreams about the possibility of ethnically cleansing Palestinians again in the West Bank are just impossible. If there is a system of apartheid, it will only be a transitional period towards one state solution, during which, of course, and this is an, an issue we are discussing with ourselves as Palestinians, because we have to take into consideration the fact that our struggle is not becoming only a struggle to end an illegal occupation, but it's also becoming a struggle against a system of discrimination. So if it is consolidated as a system of apartheid, then you will see the Palestinian struggle, especially when we talk about generation change and gap, you will see the Palestinian struggle transforming to become a powerful struggle against a system of apartheid that nobody can justify in the 21st century. Uh, you raised uh, some, some very interesting points. I think we're, we're about ready to go to the audience uh, for some questions. Uh, before we do, uh, I'm told that we actually have the honor of being joined by uh, the UN uh, Envoy for Middle East Peace, uh, Mr. Robert Seri, is here in the audience with us, and I understand he would like to make a few words. You, uh, uh, would you like to say something now or at the end of the session? Okay, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Do you hear me? Um, well, I happen to be here on a one-day uh, uh, visit to, to Qatar and uh, happy to be also here in this session with some of my friends from Palestine. I've been uh, listening uh, with much interest, in particular to the Gaza part. I mean, there so many issues have been raised that I think uh, I wish to limit myself maybe to an observation and a question to uh, some of the panelists about Gaza. I actually just came from Gaza. I, um, I, I was there on Sunday because I wanted to meet with the four new ministers in Gaza, the Gaza ministers, and uh, we did so in, the, uh, the, the, in, in one of the ministries. I found that was symbol symbolically important, and also I wanted to underscore the United Nations' full support for this uh, development. But now, the question is indeed, as you said, uh, Mustafa, whether this is for real, is this about managing the division or about what it should be, ending it. And if it is about ending it, of course, forming the government of national consensus was only the first part of it. And I think it is very important for, for the Palestinians now actually to, uh, to work on a positive agenda for this, uh, for this government. I think also that it is very important for people, both in the West Bank, but maybe even more so in Gaza, to see some dividends. Of this, uh, of this unity development. Uh, and here, a word of some caution and also some, I'm, I'm a little bit worried. I have been to Gaza and in fact, the first thing we have seen in Gaza is that banks are closed now because of a payment crisis. Uh, the, uh, there is this issue of what to do with the payment of, uh, uh, of uh, government employees which have been hired by, uh, by Hamas. Clearly, this is one of the first challenges of the new government. How are you going to integrate the government? 
how are you actually going to do it, the reunification of Gaza and the West Bank under one authority? Now, this is an, uh, an issue why I am also uh, partly here in, uh, in Qatar, because it is clear that some outside financial help will be probably needed for a temporary safety net to make it work. But my question to you is, how are you going, also as representatives of civil society, to going to ensure that this is going uh, to be an opportunity not to be wasted again? You told us that Palestinian people very much want uh, that they want it, and I know that that is true. What is civil society going to do? It's a question to you, Mustafa, and also to you, Omar, uh, about, about this issue. I can assure you that when it comes to the United Nations, we will try to give this new development every support because I believe this is very important for the Palestinians to concentrate on absent negotiations. Not that I like the fact that there are no negotiations, because with no negotiations, it simply means that you are only digging yourselves deeper into a one-state reality. But it is also important to have this unity development, because with any negotiations in the future, it, it, it does give also a better opportunity, actually, to, uh, to, to, to work uh, towards a two-state solution and not a three-state reality. Thank you. Uh, Omar, uh, as a representative of uh, civil society in Gaza, would you like to take a, a stab at responding? Uh, I, would, I would like to uh, confirm the importance of uh, his role since the uh, embargo and the role of the United Nations enhancing the steadfastness of the Palestinian people in general and the Gaza people in uh, general. We cannot neglect the role of the Red Cross. It was exercising pressure on both parties. Uh, it maybe it's part of the strategic that the political system does not interact in adequate way with the civil uh, society. Though the Palestinian community is old and it is deep rooted in the uh, Middle East, uh, but maybe the civil society maybe sometimes is to gain certain uh, profits. Uh, I was in the uh, ceremony when uh, Mr. Mustafa came and I met my brothers in uh, Hamas, Mr. Uh, Yusuf Marzouk, and we ought to establish a civil uh, society that can exercise the pressure to continue the reconciliation and to keep the unity and maintain it. The situation in Gaza is catastrophic. So we have responsibility, and thank you for your interest in this topic. Thank you. Shukran, Omar. شكرا جزيلا على سؤالك ولا جهودك. Being in Gaza, this is very important. We are facing a crisis, and I'm sorry my my phone rang while we were talking because these were the guys who are in conflict now calling, and the the there is a problem. And let me explain the problem quickly because it's important for the audience to know. When the new unity government was formed, uh, it had to pay the salaries of the employees, of course. Bef when the internal division happened seven years ago, the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah told the employees in Gaza that they can be paid their salaries if they don't go to work. Because if they would be working, they would be working with the go Hamas government. So almost 70,000 employees were sitting home and receiving salaries for seven years. Now, of course, Hamas government had to run the educational system, the hospitals, etc., etc. Not only the security apparatus. There is a whole sector of civil servants who are not Hamas, maybe, at all. They are just normal people. And they employed about 40,000 people. Now, when the unity government was formed, there was an assumption that, of course, the unity government will take over the responsibility for everybody. What happened is that the unity government paid only the salaries, sent salaries for those 70,000, but those who have been working for seven years were, did not get salaries. So that's why they are protesting today. And we have now a crisis. So the problem we face 
is that instead of showing people in Gaza that the unity is leading to improvement in their daily life, we're showing the opposite. And that's why this problem has to be resolved. It's not easy because the PA is told by certain international forces that if you start paying these salaries, we will cut the aid to you, which is, in my opinion, very unconstructive. How can you support unity and then tell the government, and, and there are governments, and I want to thank Qatar for that here, because Qatar is stepping in and saying, I am ready to pay for at least an interim period to cover the cost of these salaries. But then the PA cannot, the PA is told by certain international countries that you cannot, use, you cannot even take the money and pay it. Come on. How can this, these people be paid then? If you don't take the responsibility, then you are telling the people in Gaza you should have another government. This is very complex, and it requires a serious, responsible approach, because for me, the most important thing is that the people in Gaza who are suffering from lack of water, lack of electricity, siege over more than seven years, unemployment that is almost 90% among young, educated people, should be relieved a little bit. It's inhuman, inhuman to keep the people in Gaza in this situation. And it is totally unacceptable. That's why we will be working on that, this issue, today, after this meeting, to try to find a solution. But also, in addition to that, I think there is a very important <coughs> issue which has to be uh, solved in cooperation uh, and the goodwill of the Egyptian government, which is the Rafah crossing. It's very, very important to relieve the situation on human beings in Gaza, on patients, on people who need to travel to study by solving the problem of Rafah. And there are ways to do that in cooperation with the PA. And third, of course, the more difficult issue is the issue of security, which will come later. And it has also to be resolved because you cannot, uh, you cannot have a unity uh, situation without dealing uh, with that issue. Uh, finally, finally, I'm stopping here. Finally, of course, it's very, very important to respect the issue of freedom, that there are no political arrests, no political oppression. Otherwise, the unity will not work. There are lots of problems in front of us, and we will try to deal with them. Obviously, right. a lot of very complicated issues to deal with in Gaza and uh, the government in general. Um, I, I have uh, in my list uh, Manal, uh, Mike, uh, this gentleman in the center, I believe, and the gentleman in the front. I don't know if we'll have uh, time for, for, for all of them, but let's take them all together and then have our panelists say a quick final word, but please be as brief as you can. Yeah, no, thank you very much. This is one of the best panels I've seen in terms of candid and helping us address the issues. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to ask is, what is the unity government, and particularly when we're talking about unity and social fabric, what are they doing to really ensure the voice of women? Uh, you know, we know the role of Palestinian women. We have no doubt that they play a powerful role, but very frequently they're missing at the top level in the decision making. And, you know, in terms of social fabric and everything else that was discussed, I hope that you can give some attention to the role of women. Good question. And Mike in the back? Is there a mic for Mike? Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, Khaled, I wanted to pick up on something you threw out uh, about the possibility of this unity government as a duopoly. Uh, because for some commentators, it looks like the, these two parties were pushed together in um, an alliance of a, a temporary alliance of convenience. Uh, with Hamas being pressured by the CC government and, um, and Fatah be, being, uh, being pressured by Mohammed Dahlan, uh, the United Arab Emirates, and, and others. Um, and so shouldn't we just see this as the two parties coming together in order to, uh, in order to weather the pressures coming from the inter-Arab system? If you, if you disagree with that, could you explain the role of the inter-Arab system in the, um, in, the, in the agreement? Okay. In the center? Uh, I'll, I'll speak English. The question how the consolation will be implemented and so far we are seeing a lot of uh, detention by PLO members uh, by uh, or, or Hamas members are been detained by the PA. And one more thing, how can the 
how would the reconciliation would be uh, achieved in the light of the detention and arrest by Hamas uh, members by the uh, Palestinian Authority? Uh, just one more thing, I had further to the economical problem. Now let's go. Please, this gentleman in the front. I'm Zakaria Matar from the the National Conscious uh, Front. You, you see that the, we need to hear the voice of the Palestinian. Do you uh, trust the the Egyptian co-authority that will open Rafah exit uh, point where you can uh, exp I am an Egyptian. I apologize for any uh, false accusation or any damage that uh, happened to you. We are a uh, national liberalist and all the Egyptians, what happened in Egypt is, is going to be a temporary crisis that will, will be over shortly. Uh, and, and how it will respond. Um, please, very, very briefly, in uh, 30 seconds each. Uh, 30 seconds. Uh, Robert's uh, question would, uh, would take 30 hours. But uh, Robert, I am so glad that you've raised the questions you've raised. It was very good news that the agreement itself was domestic, was homemade. For the first time, there was no third party. However, the implementation of the agreement can never be but global. Global in the sense that Israel has to take its responsibilities. The four ministers you met in Gaza was because they were deprived of traveling to Ramallah. You know the situation. There has to be a serious easing of the, the blockade. Egypt has to take its part in really, really revisiting its uh, border arrangement at this very moment. Uh, thanks to Qatar uh, uh, for providing this, but we need more than Qatar because this is an, a process that would, re would require a lot of uh, implementation. And you, uh, Robert, and the international community must revisit the economic doctrine now. Gaza, wh while we might have to pay for the public sector, we have to start planning the alternatives to public employment. We have to think about Gaza's very vivid resources Sources, about access to Gaza, about turning the private economy into the main source. Very last sentence about the duality of the system, Fatih Hamas, how to end that. That's why this agreement is a source of optimism for me, your question, because it says that this government is only responsible primarily on one thing, convening national elections. And when national elections come, I hope this duality uh, will end. About the Hamas uh, arrest, I don't have information, my friend. But I tell you, what we are doing in Gaza and the West Bank and the uniting the government and uniting our territory and our political representation way, way outweighs this. And I hope we will be larger because Gaza drifting away from the Palestinian cause because no Israeli official even mentions Gaza because of the situation and the gravity we are facing. These are exchanges. We should not even focus on them. We should be set head on Thanks. the target. Thanks, Hassan. Anyone else want to respond? Don't forget the question on women. Hassan, can uh, <laughs> with respect to the detention in the West Bank, this time, this is this time we need Hamas to rely in terms of the P the prisoners and the exchange detention and arrests because of the last seven years. A lot of interest was established, interest of businessmen and other fractions. In response to our colleague from Egypt, we actually, we, we actually, Egypt is highly acknowledged by the Palestinian people, and we realize that this, that's what see what was happening now in Egypt is not real. Even some Palestinians hide their identity inside uh, Egypt. This makes us feel how big this disaster is. I uh, will eventually know that. Uh, the, the, the embargo will be lifted, and we, we wish the best for uh, Egypt. And this is uh, a message to the new Egyptian regime without intervening in the Egyptian affairs. I would like to make first very, very short comments. One regarding the uh, visit. Uh, I think we should stop 
politicizing education because then it becomes indoctrination. This uh, uh, idea was a trip uh, in the line of the Holy Quran, uh, which says, وَقُلْ رَبِّ زِدْنِي عَلْمًا Say, God, advance me in knowledge. And, uh, and as such, it was something to advance students in knowledge. The second, um, regarding the two state or one state, I don't believe in the one state. I think that's a mirage. No, uh, no one wants it in the sense that the Israelis do not want it and the Palestinians want a national homeland also. And so they find their identity in a Palestinian state. And so the two state, I believe, is the more uh, sustainable option. Also, I believe that the instead of reforming the PLO, uh, we should just uh, dump it and move on to the state of Palestine, rather than the PLO was an, uh, was a transitional entity. The PA is a transitional entity, and we should focus on the state of Palestine, which is the permanent entity. Thank you. Last word. Stop uh, well, I'm glad I'm speaking after you to disagree with you. <laughs> if you eliminate the PLO, there has to be an alternative structure. You can't eliminate the PLO because you cannot eliminate six million Palestinians who are not in the West Bank or Gaza. And you cannot eliminate the totality of the Palestinian cause. So, in my opinion, this is an issue that, uh, in my opinion, I have a different opinion, basically, clear. It's, uh, we, we have to reform the PLO, or otherwise, there will be movements that start to create an alternative structure. That's, that's as basic as that. I think most of the questions were answered, but I want to just uh, comment on one issue. Somebody spoke about Fatah and Hamas being pushed to this agreement. Yes, of course, they were, there are change in political factors. Uh, that's how politicians work. How, that's how parties work. I mean, presidents in different countries change their positions also because of political factors. So it's just a natural, normal political process. If it was, it was only out of moral uh, responsibility, they would have concluded this agreement long time ago. We all know that. So uh, this is not a negative factor, but at the same time, it is our responsibility to use this, this momentum, which led to the, to the signing of the last agreement, to make it an established fact that cannot be reversed. Rever that is our duty as people who believe in unity, as civil society, as people who believe this is the best way for the Palestinian future. Thank you. Thank you. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it at that. Thank you all for joining us and for indulging us and in going over the a lot of time. Uh, please join me in thanking our, our wonderful panel. And I'm sorry we didn't get to respond to all of the questions. Um, but I'm afraid we're, we're out of, we're, thank you. Thanks.